Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Filippo Voltaggio. And he's here today to share with us his new book, The Little Dog That Could, A True Story of Life, Love, and Miracles. And he's also here today to share with us his groundbreaking program, The Recalibration. Now, Filippo is a business and professional life coach, keynote speaker, author, and the former junior manager at IBM. While studying at the University of California, San Diego, he created a coursework for an emerging field, which was not offered at the time. The creation of this field of study set the tone for Filippo's professional career. So let's welcome to the show, Filippo Voltaggio. Thank you, Marianne. Happy to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to not only talk about your book, but also the work you're doing with the recalibration. You know, I've got to ask you, let's start on the book. I mean, what inspired you and what made you decide that this was the time to write it? Oh, funny you should ask that. Uh, I I didn't want to write it. (laughs) And and so the experience happened at this point, uh, what, 13, 14 years ago with a rescue dog. And uh, it was, the, the whole process was so moving and so life-changing and not just the dog, but the people that, that came into my life around that time. It was obviously that time for me to take a leap in my consciousness. And so as... Uh, People would ask me over the the following year or so, uh, I would share the story and I would I would well up with tears or or actually tears would fall down my face and and it, it's not because the story is is it has a sad ending or anything like that. It, it's because I was so moved. Uh, I, the experience was so deep, and I still didn't understand it fully. So Dorothy, who's in the book, uh, suggested I write the experience down and turn it into a book. And I thought it was a great idea. I didn't get the turn it into a book part. What I got was just write it down. And I thought, oh, this is good. I I can learn more from the process. And so I wrote it down about uh, two years after the, the main experience. And then I did nothing with it. And people kept asking me, I thought you wrote a book. I'm like, well, I wrote it for me. But it sat on my computer for another seven or so years uh, until Dorothy again and and then uh, several other people started saying, we we want that book. And I said, I don't need to release it. And Dorothy especially said, Filippo, when things happen to you, you're a communicator, you're, you, you, you have an obligation to bring it forward. And so I thought, okay. <laughs> and, and I did. And, and, and I didn't want to also because I still don't feel like I've learned everything that was to be learned. And maybe I'll, I never will. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. I mean, in just reading the book myself, I mean, there are so many lessons. I'm sure yes. that as you go back, you're like, wow, okay, there's a whole nother perspective here for me to gain. And that, and that's me having A, written the book and then gone through several uh, cor- corrections of, you know, like uh, editing and all that. Each time I've read the book uh, and then I've started an audio version of it. And I, I want to say, Filippo, you know, in chapter two, I'm thinking, don't you get it? (laughs) Really? How many chapters does it take for you to get this? This is so easy. Of course, in retrospect, you know, means Mm -hmm. I've learned something. Yeah. I mean, well, and I love this story because this little dog actually chooses you and you're quite reluctant to even go there. (laughs) Yes. I, I had so many excuses and uh, and reasons and and all of that, but uh, you know, when when something's meant to be, it's meant to be, and it certainly was the time for for that experience to happen. It's such those, a sweet and story. those lessons. <laughs> well, and as the lessons start to develop, at what point did you realize that having this dog was teaching you more than you thought? 
You know, uh, back to Dorothy in the book, <laughs> she she was the one that said, uh, I didn't know her very well at the time, but for some reason I thought uh, her being a spiritual teacher and, and uh, well, she's so much. And, and uh, uh, I, I had just met her and I was just learning from her and, she's I, I i knew when i met the dog that i had to call her and say i met this dog but i didn't know why i wanted to tell her of all people and i told her and she said oh right well uh then then this is the the dog that that is going to teach you some lessons and i said i don't know what you're talking about this is not my dog i don't have the time for a dog or the place for a dog or uh and she said Right. Well, anyway, this dog is here to teach you some lessons. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, whatever. And so it wasn't until, you know, a good month or so in, uh, without giving out too much of the story, that that I thought, okay, well, if I'm ever going to, you know, find this dog the, the, the right home, because it's not here, then I might as well learn these lessons, whatever they are. And so I was looking for the lessons at that point. <laughs> yeah, uh, the reluctant student, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe, maybe the the subtitle. Now that you say that, should have been uh, uh, when the even when the reluctant student is ready, the teacher is going to appear, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Well, the dog's name probably should have been Yoda instead of Chichina, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it was taken. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I mean, she's you know, a beautiful Chichina anyway. <laughs> well, and so as you look back, and you know, we're not going to go deep into this story because we want people to pick up their own copy of The Little Dog That Could. Because I, I personally have felt it, that it's so impactful. You know, I, I really don't want to dive completely into it. But what would be like one of the lessons that you were like, gosh, okay, I think I got this. You know, uh, some of the lessons were simple. It, they were they were so simple, so obvious that I missed them. I, 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 I that I that I didn't think that this was a possible lesson. As simple as going for a walk and and smelling the roses. And I know that that could be a cliche, or it sounds like a cliche. It, it actually ended up being something very impactful later on in the story where I wanted to connect again um, and and feeling that I, I could connect by actually stopping and smelling the roses that I could start uh, getting, getting aligned again, getting balanced again, connecting again to, uh, to what I know to be uh, part of my experience in this lifetime that I don't often know that I'm experiencing and in, and in, and in not knowing potentially missing a lot of the experience. Mm, how true is that? I mean, how often do we do that where we're so busy with the busyness of life, we miss these things that are that would seem kind of simple. Yeah, and and I know Marianne, you and I have had uh conversations about growing up and all, and so we, we might have some qualities that are similar in our uh in our lifetime growing up. Uh, it so those of us who were lucky enough to have uh, a mom or a dad or a grandmother or an aunt or somebody that would bake cookies for us, you know, or, or actually cook in the home as opposed to warming something up or, or buying something already packaged. Not that there's anything against that, but the whole sensation of walking into the, the house and it smells like cookies being made in the oven kind of thing. And it, 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 it just solidifies the experience in a way that it doesn't just taking a, a cookie out of a package as delicious as that may be, right? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it kind of gives you this feeling of comfort and home. So it's a real, this kind of heartfelt feeling. 
Right. And, and frankly, I, my life had gotten so busy. I, I still cooked and all of that, but I, I didn't take in the, the sensations of the experience while I was doing it because I just needed to eat kind of thing when eating can be uh, taking in not just the food, but the, the smell of it, the sound of it, the, ex- the, the feel of it. Uh, and then the conversations that might happen if we're sharing it with people uh, like this experience you and I are having right now. And I'm the one that's honored to be having it with you. Thank you. Oh, well, I am always thrilled when we get to have the opportunity to talk. You have so much just insight and wisdom. And this little book does the same thing, The Little Dog That Could. It it just really touches your soul. And and so when I look at this book in your life, it has me kind of wondering, you know, has this had this impact with the lessons that you've learned from from having the dog? How has that affected your you know professional career, your personal life? Uh, in in so many ways, uh, it, it wasn't just the dog, but it was definitely a time for me to to take my consciousness and my life to uh, a whole other level. And I was very ready, and 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 I have these milestone moments in my life that that I could actually write books about and 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 frankly a lot of them still have me tearing up i recently was about to interview somebody on our show the life changes show and our guest was associated with somebody that i knew and i started sharing a story with the guest and got all teared up remembering that these milestone moments are are what built uh built me up into who I am today or help me learn more about who I am today and and also inform where I'm headed. So the little dog that could uh, specifically between the dog uh, meeting Dorothy and the, the, the lessons therein with a couple of key friends that were part of this and, and also what I wanted to learn and bring forth helped inform the life changes show help uh, inform and help create the recalibration which i know we'll talk about and and help me uh, become a life coach ultimately as well so when we look back at the wisdom that you've carried with you know just throughout your lifetime how much of this was wisdom that you already knew but it, you needed something to kind of reawaken that wisdom and others that you kind of developed as you went of course, you would ask a question like that, Marianne, because you, <laughs> you you get you get it, and and you know I I I came in with uh, certain certain questions or certain ideas or certain knowings, one might say, and, and I remember sharing those knowings or ideas, uh, feelings, uh, and very distinctly remember them not being appreciated by anybody uh, in my circle from my family or friends or circle of, 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 of um, anywhere, actually any, anybody in my life. So I, and I, and I'm, I, I'm sure it's perfect because I, needed to forget them or I needed to put them aside for a while and whether I needed to or not, I had to, uh, uh, cause it was hard to live with them in, in the kind of world that, that, that I feel I came into, but now it all makes sense in that, uh, those experiences that came at, at the very times, uh, help bridge uh, the, the the understandings or the knowings and and make it so that that now it's much much more clear uh, as I've experienced things that other people have experienced things but because I had a certain feeling about them as a child 
bridging that connection saying, oh, that's what that was. And now it, it has more depth rather than just, uh, I think things should be this way. Well, and it's interesting when people come in with a certain amount of knowledge that's kind of innate for them, like you, you know, just the journey that that's taken. And I think a lot of people resonate with that because we've got this knowing it's like, okay, I don't know how I came in with it. I've got it. And at some point that information becomes more relevant in our lives as we're going through and, and like, as you are, you're helping other people to really change their lives. The good news at this point, point in our development as a civilization uh, or this civilization uh, is that we want change and we want to to uh, I, I, I feel like we want to be better at least the people I'm encountering and uh, the, the, the people I get to engage with so as your life is at this point what do you think really fuels you know, your passion and your purpose? Well, uh, I've never answered a question like that this way. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to say something that I'm uncomfortable saying, and, and that is, is the simple answer is love. Now, uh, People have asked me, like, why did you develop the recalibration? Why did you become a life coach? And and the 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 reason I've done almost anything that I've done is I've done it because I needed it. And I either wasn't experiencing it in the way that I wanted to experience it from the outside, or I wasn't taking it in the way I wanted to be able to take it in. I wasn't feeling uh, love for myself and I wasn't loving what I was doing. So being able to connect to what I love about me, what I love about people, what I love about being alive, what I love about music, what I love to sing about, uh, as a singer. Uh, so it, it, and, and, and love uh, knowing that I, I needed, I needed love to uh, be able to make it through some difficult days or difficult challenges that I was having and not seeing it outside of me and not having it inside of me uh, that I knew of. Really, that, that search, that longing, that desire to experience that. And I, I, I could say that uh, I used to say, and, and, and uh, in answering the question, I, I would say that everything I do is is based um, on the same thing. I, I, my, the songs I pick, uh, I do love the songs when I sing, and I love to sing them, and I, and they are about love. <laughs> so, uh, so that's interesting. And then when I when I work with people one on one, I. I do my best to work with people that I can love. Like I, like I, I can see them as a friend or I can see them as a family member even and say, you know, if I can love this person, then I can really want to help them. And, uh, and, 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 and that, that precludes pretty much everything I do know. Well, it's interesting because those uncomfortable places is where we really kind of find that magic and that miracle that comes forth for us. And I really have to applaud you because you are very courageous in the way that you approach not just your your spirituality, your also your professional growth. And you do that for other people as well. You know, you mentioned the, recal- the recalibration. And I'd love for you to share for our listeners what that is. Uh, absolutely. And, and because you just said what you said before that, uh, I thank you for your, uh, acknowledgement. And, and I, and I will say that all of this has led to all of this, which is going to lead to other things. And, and so I, I, I'd love to share a quick little story on our way to the recalibration. 
um, which in a sense is also a, a moment of recalibration where I was standing in front of, well, I was in backstage in front of the largest audience I had, I was going to be performing for, uh, and it was the first audience of that size. And my older brother came backstage. It happened to be at an Italian festival. Uh, but my older brother came backstage and he noticed I was nervous. And he said, you're, you're nervous. Why are you nervous? And I was annoyed by the question because it's obvious why I'm nervous. I said to him, look at all those people out there. And he said, but you've been doing this all your life. And I didn't understand what he meant. My brother's very wise. And and I said, I've never done this before. <laughs> and he said, no, you've been doing this all your life. You were born doing this. You, as a kid, you used to always perform for the family and the, the guests and the friends and everybody that would come over. And I said, but, but that's different. He said, no, it's not. He said, in that audience, our uncles and aunts and friends and 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 people just like the people that were in the living room or in the kitchen at home he says you just don't know them yet but you could you know what they're like because you've been with them so go out and 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 sing to them perform for them like you're singing to the family and that made the connection for me that those people are family. Those people are friends. I don't know them yet. Uh, but if I knew them, then that's how I would feel about them. So let me perform for them uh, like they are already that. And so that, that uh, answers to the uh, answers to the how I treat clients or guests on the show or audiences and 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 workshop members uh attendees it, it's like I, I, if if i knew them we we might be friends so why not try and start there saying i don't know them uh in that way but if i did i would feel that and then uh we would have a different relationship so somewhere there's a bridge from stranger to friend to uh let's interact in a way that, that, uh, supports growth in that direction. I really love how your brother reframed that because, you know, I think there's pretty much every family has a kid that's done that gets up and performs. <laughs> and so we can relate with that. It's like, Oh yeah, we used to have, you know, we have to, we'd have to, you know, do luau songs or what have you. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so that reframing or, recalibration is the word I use is like he recalibrated uh my my feeling of what performing is and what uh standing in front of an audience is about and uh in, instead of uh I, I I'm nervous I'm excited now because you know I get to do this with you uh so being able to look at aspects of our life that we uh could be entering into as some of us are getting older or some of us are having children or some of us are having uh, dear ones and loved ones pass uh, as we're going from one career to another or our relationships are changing romantic and otherwise uh, that we have certain conceptions uh, preconceptions about them that that may apply, may not apply. I'll give you actually a great example that we're we're doing uh, a workshop coming up here in a couple of weeks, and and uh, one of the trainers was uh, uh, wanting to share with me a part of her story, and she said to me how she went through uh, a divorce, and of course that's always hard and and it was hard on her whole family and having grown up religiously and and it was a a, a terrible thing to do and and I should have known she just was all down on herself that she had to go through a divorce um she happens to be now uh in a wonderful relationship uh, married to another man who doesn't abuse her and mistreat her and all of that stuff so she said uh in in learning about recalibrating lives 
she said, um, how do you deal with people's belief systems? And I said, great question. Let me tell you something about your belief system. You believe that going through a divorce is a bad thing. And, and I'm oversimplifying, but I said, even if I didn't know your background and, and your, your religious uh, uh, beliefs and all of that stuff, I, I, would tend to, I would tend to say, I know a little bit about what you went through. Um, however, if you had grown up in a family or a culture that celebrated divorce, like a graduation, you would be talking about divorce in a completely different way. You would say, so my mother always said to me, she says, you're going to get married and then you're going to get a divorce. And then after the divorce, then you're going to find somebody great because, because you're going to learn something and it's going to be good for you. And so you might've been excited about getting that divorce. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that the belief system is what's making something potentially still weigh on you. The fact that you're describing it like I, I should have known better and it was a difficult this and, and it was hard on everybody. Instead, maybe if you had people around you that said, oh, great, good. Now you can go and find someone that you really love. The pressure's off and you've done that and you, 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 you made your mom happy and you married the person that they wanted you to do, whether that was right or wrong. But, but now look, you're, this is your graduation. And she laughed and she said, oh my God, if I, if I could have only thought about it like that, then would have saved me a lot of grief. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, what a great way to see it, though, you know? <laughs> well, and I'm not saying that that she should celebrate divorce or not celebrate divorce or that we should look forward to, to getting married so that we can get divorced. I'm just saying what serves you in that moment to get you to, to an even better place than where you are now? And sorry, I, that got a little long, but it literally just happened uh, less than a couple hours ago. And uh, I love that story, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna share that uh, going forward <laughs> <laughs> well, in a more I, concise way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the way you shared it with us, and I, I think that that's a perfect place for people to kind of really understand how this can work and how it can really change their lives. So when they look at the recalibration. Like, what is the process? How, do, how does that work? I, when I finally became a life coach in, in earnest, because I was, I was doing it without knowing I was doing it with even strangers calling me and wanting to talk to me. And I wasn't sure what was going on. And they said, you should be a life coach. And I, I said, I, what is that? And they said, exactly what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> like oh well maybe i should get a certificate or something and so then when i when i called it something and i and i made it official and i uh, in in working with every single client i i take copious notes uh at, at while we're we're talking and i started and I, and i always give exercises at the end of every uh life coaching session for uh, the the client to take with them and work with throughout the week until the next time we see each other. Uh, so I started to look at the exercises and the answers that came back. And I, I started to look at my notes and how there were similarities in, in all of the conversations. Of course, that's partly me where I would tend to go. And it's also partly the kind of people I attract. But whether they were CEO or administrator of a hospital or a stay-at-home mom or that, that some of the same things would come up. I also noticed that if I asked a question a certain way, people would say they didn't want to talk about that or they were already dealt with that. But I realized that they wanted, well, they needed to talk about it potentially and that they really hadn't dealt with it. So. I remember one famous case where I asked a woman uh, about her mother, uh, her relationship with her mother, and she, her face turned red, 
And she said in an angry voice, my mother, I don't want to waste any more of my time or money talking about my mother. I've <laughs> dealt with my mother issues. I <laughs> dealt with that years ago and, and we're fine. We're just fine. And I thought, okay. <laughs> you know, noted, not fine um, with the mother issue. But I realized that in the direct questioning, it might have been the way she had been asked this before, or uh, it might have been, um, uh, it, you know, it was it was just too direct. So I started going around uh, and asking questions from the back doors, uh, for example, or or, or from the side uh, and from behind the stage, and uh, and and so this set of questions started to develop that would get to the heart of the mother issue, so to speak, if there were something like that, without even mentioning the mother almost. And uh, I thought, wow, this is really interesting, really clever. So between those two things is that, that everybody seemed to be needing a certain foundational work, let's put it that way. And the fact that, that they didn't like to be or answer the questions straight on, but they didn't have a problem answering him in a different way. I put a series of question together, uh, questions together, and then with the help of Dorothy and Mark, my business partners with the Life Changes Show, as we put this set of questions together and started to propose them to people in, in, in sections, like this section is going to be about this, and this section is going to be about this, uh, as people started to answer the questions, they started having ahas because they were opening up to the way they think about things differently without knowing they think about them that way because nobody's ever asked them that way, if that makes sense. No, oh, it makes perfect sense because what you, it, it sounds like what you did is you took away what the trigger was, but you're still addressing the root issue that they don't want to touch with a stick. Right. I, I used to, when I used to give presentations, uh, well, I still do, but uh, way at the beginning to, to try and help people visualize, like if they were interested in taking this course or not, one of the, one of the memes I would put up on the screen uh, was uh, a picture of a, of a mother, say from the 1950s or so, the way she's dressed and probably holding a dessert, I think, if I remember correctly. And the meme said uh, in captions, what did your mother always say to you? And whenever I put that up, everybody would, would raise their hand and they knew exactly what it was. And sadly, most of the ones that that would answer would it would always be a negative thing now surely hopefully mothers also said a lot of wonderful things uh but sometimes those didn't get in or sometimes they didn't stick as much and it's not just mothers it's fathers it's brothers and sisters it's uh, uh, it's teachers it's it's clergy and sometimes they could be these amazing people who made a mistake or who didn't know how to address this issue or talk about this particular thing. And for whatever reason, that becomes their life lesson or the bane of their existence. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> for yeah, the child. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, that usually is one of the things that when we look from a spiritual aspect, that we're here to maybe a lesson we're here to learn or gain right. perspective on. So it's, it's usually while it can seem like it's a bad thing really isn't. Exactly. Exactly. And, and then when those ahas start to happen, uh, then, then life can change a lot easier and quicker. And the thing that I like most about this is that in the recalibration, there is, no such thing as a right answer or a wrong answer. And there's no, uh, there, there's no approval. Like it, it, it's not about me or any of the facilitators. It's about what each person gets out of it. And what the main thing we want to give them, 
is for them to walk away with not only all the questions, but the, 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 the use of the questions as a tool so that if they get stuck with something or are asking themselves about this particular aspect of their life, they can go and do the recalibration process on specifically that on their own if they choose to, or a lot of them come back and do another recalibration. Uh, and so what has happened when we started the recalibration as a general course, what has since happened is we've been asked and have done uh, a recalibration on aging, a recalibration on sexuality, and a recalibration on shame, and a recalibration on relationships. Uh, and we could go on every aspect of our lives. We can recalibrate because we've changed. The world has changed. Uh, technology, uh, uh, philosophy, the way we think about things, the, the politics, everything has changed. And, and have we stopped to look at a particular aspect of our lives and see how, how do these changes affect or inform, if, if at all, uh, how we feel about ourselves in certain areas or how we feel about our lives in certain areas or going forward in certain areas. Now, how profound is that? Because I think a lot of times when people get to this point of personal, um, like, you know, either kind of self-awareness or some type of an awakening, you know, they realize that they've been kind of bobbing around in the sea of life and here they actually get to make choices and how everything can be. Absolutely. And, and, and what it means to them at, at that point. I take, take, for example, I, I, I've known several people with this issue, which has been a blessing and, and for some maybe a curse. But th there have been people who have said, I want to be rich, I want to be rich. And if you had asked them what, what that means, they might have put a dollar figure on that. And with a couple of people, I've asked them that question. And it's hard for them to think back on what it was they thought was rich, because now they don't think that's rich anymore, a lot of them. And so now that I want to be rich is still something that's ruling their lives, even though they might have more riches than the majority of the people on the planet, literally, and they still in, have that mindset of, I want to be rich, and are missing other aspects of their human existence because they're still chasing after something that they may already have. Mm, I love that. Because there's, you know, there's wealth in many ways. It could be in friends. It could be love. It all doesn't have to equate to money. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And even, even the good things. One of my favorite stories is of a woman who had this amazing childhood. In one of the series of questions, she was interpreting uh, the questions to be about her childhood, which is fine. Uh, it, it, it is, it can be, it could also be about yesterday. So when we talk about the past, wherever the mind goes, that's where we want to work. So she went to her childhood and, uh, stopped me while I was walking by her, uh, while everybody was answering the questions and said to me, you know, this doesn't apply to me. And I said, what doesn't apply to you? And she said, the questions. And I said, how so? And she said, well, I had a perfect childhood. And I said, well, then write that down. It, it's not asked. The questions aren't asking you whether you had a bad childhood. It's asking you questions about your childhood, if that's what you're interpreting. And she said, but what am I supposed to put down? It's all good. And I said, maybe you can get more specific. She said, well, I was a good dancer. I was, a, I was pretty. I was, had a great body. And, and she went on and I got good grades. And I said, okay, then maybe you write that all down. And she said, but that seems silly to me. I'm here to work on my issues, not on what's good. And I said, write those down and, and then we'll address it in group. So when we got to the group, and uh, everybody was talking about certain issues. She told us how great everything was and how pretty she was and how this and that. 
So when it came to the second set of questions, she said to me, uh, maybe this isn't for me. And I said, if it isn't for you, you're free to go. And um, she said, I said, but you are here. So maybe you answer the question. She said, but again, my adolescent. So that's where she went. She says, those were good too. It was great. I said, please write that down. Uh, by the third set of questions, she didn't flag me down as I walked by her. She was too busy crying. And uh, when we came into group, she was very quiet. She didn't want to share. So we moved on. And as I started to to move on, she stopped me and said, do you know how hard it was to be the perfect child? I had to be good at everything I did. I hated dance. I hated this. I hated that. But they kept saying, oh, you're perfect. You're our perfect child. You're so beautiful. You're so this. You're so that. And she said, I hated every minute of it. Oh, wow. And all of us were, you know, obviously, you know, I, I knew that there was stuff there, but, but, you know, but to, to have her have that breakthrough and to have to be honest with herself after all these years at 70 something, and to be honest in with the group and say, you know, even the good, all the compliments, all the attention she was getting and all the perfectness that she was, she took it as uh, an edict to you yeah, always have to be like this, or if you're not like this, we don't love you kind of thing. That is so powerful. And, and here, you know, it's interesting as people go through this process, they may think that, oh, you know, this part of my childhood was great. This part of my life was perfect, but there's always something that's kind of underlying that they can really, you know, learn from all that. As you said to me before the show started, we could always go deeper, right? And mm-hmm. and and that's just it. I feel, uh, for myself included, when when I was asked to do the recalibration on relationship, I thought, oh gosh, let me do it on myself first, specifically for that. And boy, did I learn things. And then when I was asked to do it uh, specifically for sexuality, I'm like, ooh. Okay, let me do that. And boy, did I learn things. And the same for shame. It's like, wow, there's there's so much we could learn about ourselves if we're interested in doing so. And one of the beautiful things about this is, is the more we learn about ourselves, the more we can relate with other people, I feel. Yeah, I would agree with you on, on that. Where can our listeners learn more about the recalibration and sign up or get more information and and just you know move forward with that well thank you for asking i've i've come into the habit of 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 setting up websites for the for for the actual names of everything i do <laughs> so the recalibration has a website <laughs> the recalibration.com uh, well, the little go. dog that could <laughs> has a website the little dog that could.com <laughs> Uh, well, the then let's talk about show. I was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I really do want to spend a little time talking about the Life Changes show because I think it's so impactful. I mean, you've got some of the greatest guests on there, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about the inspiration behind the show and have some of the inspiration you're having now with it. Uh, happily, happily, uh, since I mentioned the, uh, little dog that could.com website, I, I want to mention that people can find the book on your website and I'm honored to be part of moments with Marianne's, uh, book club. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and then speaking of, uh, thanking you, we have had some amazing guests on the show and a couple in particular, thanks to you, Marianne, and uh, a couple coming up actually, thanks to you. But one in particular, uh, is going down as one of the, the, one of my favorite moments on the Life Changes show. And that was with, uh, Selene, uh, Selene Caloni. Uh, so thank you so much. Or actually, Caloni Williams, right? Yes. Uh, and she loved 
loved, love the time that you guys spent together. Uh, you, you know, she was in town for a short time and, and we normally do our shows live. So if anybody's listening to this before the end of 2019, the show will air um, the, uh, the day before New Year's, actually, with Selene oh. uh, on the Life Changes Show website. So, uh, uh, So they won't find it just yet, but when it comes out, they'll see why I loved it as well. And uh, I, again, so much of what I do today comes from, like you pointed to Marianne, uh, my childhood. And so as a, as a childhood, as a child, I was very inquisitive and I would ask deep questions and it would annoy a lot of people. (laughs) (laughs) And and I think it would annoy, well, maybe not now, definitely not now, but, uh, but there was, was a time when I used to say, I, uh, I, I hope I don't grow up to have a child like me because I saw how difficult it was for my parents. But but <laughs> my questions weren't easy to answer. And 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 also I feel uh I I did go to university. I graduated with a degree. I, I started working with uh one of the uh, at the time, third largest companies in the world in in high tech, and uh, so I, I do know what it's like to have a nine to five and deal with traffic. Although it's not really nine to five, it's more than that. And uh, so I I got to experience all of that. And when I when I took a sabbatical, uh, so to speak, from that work, and ended up never going back, but. Uh, I delved into all of what we're talking about and, and, and so many of the authors and uh, workshop leaders and uh, seminar leaders, et cetera, uh, videos and DVDs and cassettes at the time. And uh, I listened to so much and, and studied so much uh, to get the answers that I always wanted. And, and I still want, and, and the answers are changing uh, as, as everything else changes. So the show was a, a natural progression uh, as I started learning uh, things that were not readily available on TV or on the news or uh, taught in, in any of our public schools, at least. Uh, like I went through, I was learning things that that people would ask me about and I would share and people would say, well, you should, you should teach this. I don't know enough to teach it. Uh, uh, and, and I'm not, uh, uh, but there are people out there who, who know this and maybe I, we should be interviewing them. And so we have so many, not only interesting guests, but interesting subjects. And, and every week we offer a musical guest and, uh, and their live musical performance, and they bring their understanding of 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 the work that that they 've been doing through music it doesn 't matter what it is that we do just this morning. I was talking to somebody about spirituality quote unquote and and she beautifully said, uh, "I know somebody who brings spirituality to the world by gardening, and I loved that i couldn 't agree more mm. I love that. It it's so wonderful when people find those things that really you know, ignite their soul. You know, it it just brings so much to everyone's experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and the gardening, for example, if we, I, I I have friends who have homes that that are not just beautiful on the outside, but on I mean on the inside, but on the outside with the flowers that they plant and the trees and the fruit trees and the this and the that, and it just it it feeds the soul to walk in there. And I say or walk through their gardens, and I say thank you for this moment that that I get to do this because you put this much love into this. So, you know, my goodness, you do so much work and there's so much that you're involved in. If our listeners, and don't laugh at me because I know what you're going to say, <laughs> if our <laughs> listeners want to connect with you, what is the best website for them to do that? 
<laughs> you know, actually, uh, I, I would say my personal website uh, is filippovoltaggio.com. Uh, however, I, I spend so much time with uh, with our guests and and involved in in what they're doing that that I that I tend to to spend more time either blogging or posting on the Life Changes Show. So lifechangesshow dot com would be the 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 central place I think to to connect with me. Oh, perfect. Well, Filippo, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, no. Has it been five minutes already? <laughs> <laughs> you know I'd keep you longer, you know. <laughs> but I know you're a busy man. <laughs> so. Well, Marianne, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of getting to chat with you a couple times, and I look for many, many more times. It's always a pleasure, and I'm glad that, that we let people in on our conversation today. <laughs> I'm glad we got to do that too. My goodness, it's always such a treat to talk with you. If you would like to connect with Filippo, please do at his website, filippovoltaggio.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.